All right, uh, welcome to SkeptiCamp. Uh, my talk is called Models of the Mind, and I want to begin with just saying, well, why do we care about having an accurate model of, of our own minds? Well, I think as skeptics, you know, we want an accurate view of reality in general, but in particular, having an accurate view of your own mind allows you to compensate for those, those areas of your mind that, that may not be rational. And so we can we basically can compensate for 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 our lack of rationality by knowing how our own mind works. So I want to kind of focus on various different models of the mind that have been proposed in history. And uh, I'm going to start with Rene Descartes. He's a 15th century French philosopher, mathematician, and scientist. And uh, he's no best known for the Latin phrase uh, "cogito ergo sum," I think, therefore I am. And he was a believer in what we call dualism, which is the idea that the universe is comprised of two different substances. There's the physical and there's the mental. And human, human rational thought is composed of this mental substance, which is, non, which is inherently non-physical. And uh, now there's one problem with this view, and that is if there is, in fact, these two substances, how do they interact? You know, if you lift your arm, how is it that the, the mental has affected the physical? And Rene Descartes had an answer. He thought that within a human brain, there's a region called the pineal gland, which he mistakenly thought only humans had. But he thought that pineal gland was the, the, the locus where the mental and physical interacted. And so, you know, that was his answer for, for how the, the mental and physical interacts. Well, if you're of a skeptical bent, you probably are not a subscriber to dualism. You're probably more likely to be a materialist, and you think that the the brain is a purely physical um, entity, and the mind is just a result of what the brain does. But you know, we don't have too, enough time in this presentation to go into the debate between dualism and materialism, but if you do want more in, uh, a talk about dualism, you might consider going to this person's uh, talk. He's actually presenting on, on October 21st at the, October, at the Ottawa Writers Festival. He, his name is uh, Eben Alexander, and he, he's a neurosurgeon. Back in 2008, he contracted bacterial meningitis, and he was in a coma for a, a week, almost died, and, but he did recover, and when he, did, when he recovered, he wrote this book about his experience, his near-death experience. Um, but, you know, as a skeptic, I would say the word proof is probably pretty strong. <laughs> if I were to give it a different title, I would say maybe this would be more accurate. <laughs> so, so anyway, that's, that's dualism. But let's, let's move over to uh, materialist philosopher Daniel Dennett. Now, he, of course, he's a philosopher of mind, and he's written many books, including this one, Consciousness Explained. And uh, I want to highlight one model that he has presented in this book. Um, it's actually an anti-model. He's warning you against this intuitive uh, model, which actually relates to dualism somewhat. It's, it's, it's about um, the, the idea of, of a homunculus that is within your mind, within your, 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 your head. So this is actually illustrated perfectly by this 20-year-old movie, Men in Black, in, two, in 1997. Um, Will Smith's character is inspecting what looks like a human cadaver in the morgue. And surprisingly, it opens up. And it turns out there's actually this tiny alien inside who's manning the controls, you know, moving the robot, and he's looking, watching these screens. You know, you know, he's basically, this is a perfect model of what a homunculus is. So Dennett is warning us by, um, he, he, he titles this model of the mind the Cartesian theater. And it's very intuitive, because if you introspect on your own uh, consciousness, you might think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm located maybe a few centimeters uh, behind my eyeballs. You know, you, there's this real uh, feeling that you are inside of your head. Um, but you don't get very far with this kind of explanation, because, well, if there's a little person inside your head, well, how do you, how does that little person work? Is there a little person inside of him? And a little person inside of him? You know, there's an infinite regress of these homunculi, and it's turtles all the way down. 
so basically Dennett is der derisively proposing this model and warning you that you know you should avoid thinking of your mind in terms of having a consciousness which is uh, located at a certain spot. It's more distributed through the mind. So even materialists might fall prey to certain um, dualist kind of ideas like this. Now I want to move to a different uh, model of the mind. This one is proposed by Jonathan Haidt. He's a researcher and a psychologist um, and he specializes in morality. He's written this book, it's an excellent book, I recommend it, called The Righteous Mind. And he, in particular, describes how it is that people on the left and right parts of, this, of the political spectrum think and why there's a difference between uh, the left and the right. And I, you know, it really helps you understand how people who you don't agree with think. And so that, I think I, this is definitely a book worth reading. But he, in this book, he proposes this analogy of the rider and elephant. And the, in this analogy, the, the rider represents conscious reasoning. So this is the, the part of your mind that you can reflect on, your conscious reasoning. And the elephant re represents automatic processes like emotion and intuition. And uh, Haidt makes the, um, he, he observes that ob evolution has created first the elephant and later has created the rider to serve the elephant. So instead of the rider being the master, He's actually there to serve the, the interests of the elephant. So the, the rider is actually good at various things. The rider can see into the future, he can evaluate alternatives, learn new skills, and he can help the elephant achieve its goals. But really, you know, if the elephant wants to do something, there's very little that the, that the rider can do to um, prevent the elephant from, from doing that thing. And in, in there's another thing that the, the rider is good at, and that is providing public relations for the elephant. <laughs> the rider can, can, can uh, give reasons for that are socially acceptable um, for the uh, actions performed by the elephant. Um, Haidt uses this phrase, emotions come first and strategic reasoning comes second. So that's one, one model of the mind. And there's another person here, Michael Gazzaniga, he also has something that reinforces this. Um, Gazzaniga is a, an author and a, neuro, and a cognitive neuroscience researcher, and he's done work on split brain patients. Split brain patients are people who have uh, serious epileptic seizures, and they've had this radical surgery where the, um, the nerves connecting the left and right brain hemispheres have been severed. The, the corpus callosum has been cut. And surprisingly, these people seem perfectly normal. They're not unusual in any way, as you might, you might expect that, they're, that they would have deficits, but it's not apparent, unless you do some uh, experiments. And, and Gazanica has done these experiments where he's arranged to um, provide visual stimulus that's only perceived by the, the nonverbal right hemisphere of the brain. And so he's given some suggestion for an action that only the right hemisphere perceives, which is nonverbal. So when he does this, and the person, if the person then falls through and, and acts based on the suggestion given to the right hemisphere, he then verbally asks the left hemisphere, the verbal left hemisphere, why did you do that? And you might think that they would say, well, I have no idea why I did that, because the left hemisphere doesn't know. But in fact, that's not what happens. These patients typically will confabulate a post hoc plausible story for why they acted the way they did, even though that, the, the verbal left hemisphere has no idea why the action was performed. So this is quite disconcerting because if this happens with split brain patients, maybe this happens with everybody all the time. Maybe you're constantly fabricating reasons for your own actions be, and be perfectly, um, a confident that those really are the reasons when maybe they're not. So here's a great analogy to try to, um, to highlight this. Supposing you have a corporation that has a board of directors, some executives, a bunch of departments, and maybe the board of directors decides on a certain action. And here's the reason. Sponsoring a local event will get us more customers, and that will more than offset the cost of funding the event. 
That's the real reason why the corporation acts. Now, they, the executives maybe will, will give instructions to the various departments. The marketing and communication department will hire a spokesperson, and they'll be given a message to deliver, which won't be the same as the, the reason that the action was initiated. The spokesperson might be given the message, we sponsored the arts fair to be a good member of the community, and especially to help needy children. Now, the spokesperson may, does not have any access to the real reason for the arts fair. They're just given this message and told to deliver it uh, to uh, the public. And actually, it works better if they don't have access to the real reason. You know, there's a danger that they might accidentally deliver the real reason when really, you know, it's more believable if they, if they actually truly believe what they're saying rather than you know, knowing that the real, the real reason for the action. So if we take this analogy, instead of a corporation, supposing we have a, a person's, parts of a person's mind instead, and maybe your emotional preferences might have a reason for a particular action. And it might be like this. Uh, participating in team sports will improve my social status and increase my mating opportunities. <laughs> but that's generally not what people say if you ask them why they did what they did. So the, the verbal and social systems might have a, um, might have a, may, might have a message that, like this. I play ultimate frisbee because I like the challenge and to stay physically fit. And this is what Michael Gazzaniga calls the interpreter. It's the part of the mind that generates plausible sounding post hoc ra rationalizations for what you do. And it might be very different from the real reason for, for why you act. Um, and so this is you know, a plausible model for how the conscious mind works. And if this is true, then um, I, I want to end with this slide. Who are you? It's quite plausible that maybe you are not who you think you are. Yeah. Thank you very much.